What Bitcoin Did Podcast. Hello there from Bogota, Colombia. How are you all? Welcome to the What Bitcoin Did Podcast, which is brought to you by Kraken, the best place to buy, sell and trade Bitcoin. I'm your host, Peter McCormack, and today I'm taking a break from my beginner's guide to Bitcoin to look at how Bitcoin is being used around the world. And following my interview in El Salvador, I have an interview with Mauricio Tovar Guitares and Alejandro Beltran Torado in Colombia. I hope I got those pronunciations right. But before that, I do have a message from my show sponsors. First up, I'd like to welcome my new sponsor, Coin Tracker, to the podcast. And with tax season upon us, it is time to get your shit together. And this year, I've been using Coin Tracker to calculate my taxes, and it couldn't have been easier to link my wallets and exchanges and get my tax calculated in just a few minutes. Their filings work in the US, UK, Canada, and Australia, so you can join the other 100,000 users who use Coin Tracker and file your crypto taxes in seconds. It is integrated with TurboTax, Coinbase, Binance, Kraken, and over 300 other exchanges and wallets, more than anyone else. And it is free to use for users who have 200 or fewer transactions in a tax year. And for listeners of the show, you can also get a 10% discount by using the link cointracker.io forward slash A forward slash WBD. It is available on the web, but they do also have an app for the Apple and Android app stores. So if you want to find out more, head over to cointracker.io, which is C-O-I-N-T-R-A-C-K-E-R dot I-O. Also, I want to welcome my other new sponsor, CypherSafe, to the podcast. If you want a very cool way to back up your private keys, then their newly released Cypher Wheel is really cool. It's one of the best private keys tools I have seen. It is a unique way to store your private keys. Machined from solid stainless steel, and that's not any steel, but 303 stainless. That was following one of Jameson Lop's famous tests, and this is the coolest Bitcoin C backup device that I have seen. The Cypher wheel is designed to be physically locked with a padlock and comes with a tamper evidence seal. So you can be aware if anyone has made an attempt to steal your seed words. So you bought a hardware wallet, right? So I know you take your Bitcoin security seriously. Now go the extra step and secure it from physical disaster with a Cypher wheel seed storage device. Find out more, head over to cyphersafe.io, which is C-Y-P-H-E-R-S-A-F-E.io to purchase your Cypher wheel and keep your Bitcoin safe. Okay, so onto the show, and we're taking a break from my beginner's guide to Bitcoin for a few weeks. I'm currently traveling through South and Central America, and while I'm here, I'm talking to people who are using Bitcoin in these countries. But don't worry, I will definitely be continuing the beginner's guide soon. So the use case for Bitcoin, it can vary from country to country. How people use Bitcoin in New York or London will differ from those on the border of Colombia and Venezuela, where speculators may have access to the best hardware wallets and sophisticated security. Those in the developing world may have to share a phone or may have limited data connectivity. So as part of my series covering Bitcoin around the world, I'm going to be visiting the far reaches of our planet to look at how different communities are using Bitcoin and the challenges they face. In this opening interview, I speak to Mauricio and Alejandro, two people part of the Bitcoin community in Bogota, Colombia, and we discuss the politics and economics of Colombia, Bitcoin regulation, and their close ties to Venezuela. I will also be traveling to Venezuela today to look at how Bitcoin is being used there. And if you've got any questions, feel free to reach out to me. My email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com. Good morning, Alejandro. Good morning, Mauricio. Thank you for your hospitality in Colombia. Nice to nice to sit down with you and talk about some Bitcoin. Thank you for having us, Peter. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Right. So let's before we kick off and get into things, let's just do a little bit of background on both of you so people know who we're talking to. And so we'll start with you, Mauricio. Just introduce yourself. Tell people what you do. Tell them a little bit about yourself. Yeah, of course. I, I've been working in technology for my whole professional life the past 10 years. And uh, we started a research group in the National University of Columbia uh, nine years ago to work on ICT technologies, uh, video games, cloud platforms, uh, mobile ap applications, things like that. And uh, four years ago, I, I learned about Bitcoin and I went to two meetups. I didn't understand anything about uh, this technology, but I saw software developers talking about Bitcoin and money. And, and I, I, I saw that was something interesting on on that it, it was it wasn't my my specific area of interest but I saw something so I, I start to to learn to 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 think about this and how to apply this in, in Colombia and uh, we start with the with the, the Viva La Bogota that it's a uh, an innovation digital lab to work on on Bitcoin and blockchain technology 
And you, Alejandro, please introduce yourself. Tell people a bit about yourself. Uh, well, I came from a traditional banking system because I was a stockbroker about 10 years ago. And, and then uh, I, I started to be an entrepreneur and started to explore new technologies. I started with crowdfunding, maybe um, as an opportunity of a traditional financial system. And then I met these Chilean guys from Buddha.com. We started the Sur BTC. It was a, a Bitcoin exchange. And well, uh, I started to, to, to know about Bitcoin and what the hell is Bitcoin. As, as a, as a stockbroker, uh, I didn't realize that, that Bitcoin uh, was, was real. Um, so I started to study more uh, about this kind of technology and decentralizing uh, system. So um, then we started, we founded Buddha.com in Colombia. And then about four years ago, I'm, I, I'm doing this. Uh, I'm exploring new technologies. We start uh, the Blockchain Colombia Foundation that is an um, NGO that are working for education, development, and communication with uh, public institutions. And then we are here uh, speaking about what connect to us that is Bitcoin is, is real and, and is the best one. Well, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you both for agreeing to do this. So one of the things I wanted to do this year, it's like a goal for me with Bitcoin, was based on my experience of last year and going into El Salvador and learning about a Bitcoin project there, I thought it would be very useful to travel around the world, uh, visit play different countries and find out how Bitcoin is being used, the different use cases, because sometimes I, I, I personally i am guilty of thinking of the Bitcoin user experience of one that just suits me. You know, I've got my you know, hardware wallet, I've got my, say, my bill fodder with my backed up keys hidden in a specific location. And what happened in El Salvador, I met a community of people who were using Bitcoin and it was being used to keep kids off the streets. They would earn Bitcoin and be able to spend it locally. But these people don't have a hardware wallet is the first thing. They don't have, they, they live in a house which is essentially a hut, you know, which anyone can break into. There's nowhere to hide a, a, a bill for all or something. So I realized then there has to be a different consideration for something such as private key management. Mm -hmm. So just that experience alone made me think I wanted to go around the world and visit places. And, and you know, as you both are aware, I went to Kukutai yesterday. That was a very useful experience. But I think, I think to get a kind of holistic view of how Bitcoin can help people across the world... You've really got to get into the locations and understand the dynamics of the country. You've got to understand the politics. You've got to understand the economy. You've got to understand, you know, how what people's lives are like. So, the the goal really from this episode is to learn a bit more about Colombia. So the starting point is, let's tell me a bit about Colombia today. Tell me a little bit about Colombia politically and economically, because based on here in. Um, Bogota, I always say it wrong, Bogota. Bogota, yeah. I keep saying Bogota, but based <laughs> in Bogota, it seems to be a thriving, fairly successful city. Mm -hmm. I've heard Medellin is, is great now. Yeah. Um, I've heard crime, well, I'm aware crime has, has fallen heavily. Yet Colombia has a history which is, you know, for me as somebody from the UK, the main things I'm aware of historically has been the drugs trade and uh, the paramilitary movements and, you know, FARC specifically. So, I don't know who wants to go first, but it'd be great to just get an understanding of where Colombia is politically right now and economically. I can jump in, yep. Um, right now, Colombia is the Latin American country that uh, have the uh, growth rate, the, the highest growth rate, mm -hmm. 3% of the GDP. Okay. In, in, in the political uh, side, we, we have a right... Um, Right political yeah. party in the in the government right now is that a is that a center right or no, it's a, more like uh, you mean uh, uh, republicans maybe okay uh, yeah. uh, people from the conservatives that that is uh one of the leadership uh, right here in colombia the leadership of, of the political side uh, uh, of the right is uh, is the leadership of the government and and they have um well, their their flag of uh, of the government is about the innovation and 
and all the economy uh, around the technology and the new technologies. Uh, but well, uh, it, it's a, a very great discussion because on the public institution, it's very different sides, uh, the very different thoughts uh, about uh, what's next on, on technologies because they have so control. I mean, it's not a capitalist system. It's more like, a, I don't know what to say, feudalismo, okay. it's more feudal, because you have all the control of the system. So you, you, don't, you don't open the, this, this kind of opportunities when you see maybe in the US or maybe in Europe, uh, they are opening to new technologies because they know that they are changing. Uh, right here is more conservative, more restrictive, I, I, yeah, in my yeah. experience, right. There are some good things. Maybe we have to present both because it's true what Alejandro said. Uh, but the president, the actual president, I have to say, it's, it's the president that knows better about new technologies. And he is doing some bets around that. Uh, for example, he started a, a high council of digital transformation for the presidency. They start with the World Economic Forum, uh, Fourth Industrial Revolution Center, and uh, he knows about this because uh, he's working in the in the IDB in the in the past. But on the other hand, there is some uh, restrictions from, for example, the regulator of uh, the financial system in, in Colombia. Then send some they send some letters to, to the banks saying that they don't they cannot use, buy, sell, or anything with cryptocurrencies. And uh, that is uh, having a lot of consequences in the ecosystem because, uh, for example, the exchanges have some problems to open uh, bank accounts. But also, for me, there is a risk for the country because, you know, everybody in the world is, is uh, doing some research and doing some projects on this, and the banks in Colombia cannot do it. So it's a risk because the competition is not, is not local anymore. The competition is global. So all of these companies like, you know, I, I don't know, Libra, Facebook, the central bank in the digital currency of China, they're doing things. And in Colombia, we're not doing. So that's a risk, risk for, for the country. So they're, they're both uh, parties, uh, like a very good speech of the president, but on the other hand, the regulator have a lot of restrictions. Okay, so we'll come to the, we'll come back to the regulations and the restrictions yeah. around the uh, regard of Bitcoin. I just want to get a bit more into the what the political status is. So the current president is Ivan Marcus. Is that pronounced right? <laughs> Ivan, 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 Ivan Marcus. Uh, what, what is the what is the name of the party he leads? Centro Democratico. Uh, Democratic. Center <laughs> party, Democratic party. Okay, and Democratic, they, yeah. <laughs> right? And they've been in power for two years. Previous to his party, was it also a right party? Yeah, it's more like center party, but I, I think it's more like right party because okay. center right. Yeah, we uh, our governments uh, about twenty years ago since Alvaro Uribe Vélez from the right party. Uh, took the, the the government. The government was uh, of right president. So uh, at at this moment, we are living a, a violent situation about social leaders that are are killing in the cities, maybe the places that that they are working. So we are living a, a new kind of violence right here in Colombia. It's not the same thing that we live in the 90s and the 80s, that maybe is the uh, drug traffic. It's the same, it's the same problem, I, th uh, I think. Uh, the drug traffic, the drug dealers, and, and, and Mexico uh, took uh, the advantage of of the um, uh, peace peace process uh, right here in Colombia, mm -hmm. but then we we continue this kind of violence that in the cities we are not living as well. Okay. Uh, but uh, in the um, in the next uh, next places that that we have the con in the country they are living so, so it's, it's very critical that they know and the the president has the challenge to. Uh, to forbid and, and maybe stop this this, this situation. Yeah. So the constitution of Colombia is a, a single term presidency, right? There's no re-election, but you have for the so you you were in a period of conservatism and that's been successful 
economically for the country. As we know, especially in South America, there tends to always be a swing from right to left. They're all, uh, I, I've noticed that there tends to be uh, a bigger gap between the rich and the poor in South America than, say, in Europe. And there tends, tends to be a smaller middle class in South America. Is there, are there any social issues at the moment? Is there a, 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 any wealth inequality here in Colombia that is causing any level of protest, any le level of social unrest? Is that happening? Yeah, let's say let's say that uh, Colombia have been success in the economic growth, but not in the inequality okay. uh, aspect of, of of the economy. Because, <clears throat> for example, in in Colombia, the banks' growth are at nine point five percent, something like that, and and the the GDP grows three percent. So, uh, it's it's not that everybody is growing at three percent. Is that some uh, sectors of the economy are growing more, and the other don't see any of that growth. So that's that's a very big problem and maybe because of that it's it's not that it's it not it's not from the past years actually there, there is a long story on on that situation. And uh, maybe for that very long situation there the the past year started a, a protest here in Colombia uh, because the people are very mm, don't want that situation anymore. They they want to the change. They want to have more opportunities. They want to have access to the education. They want to have a better health system, and uh, the, the the people is 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 waiting for that. And uh, that that's a big movement that it starts like uh, two months ago, and uh, uh, that it's not finished actually. It's it's like a it's it's, it's a little stopped, but is there? Is there? So it, yeah, there's like um almost if we compare it to my experience in Santiago when I was uh, with Gu Guillermo. Um, Guillermo. Gu Guillermo. <laughs> I'm so <laughs> terrible at my pronunciations. Um, you know, whilst the trigger in Santiago was the raising of the metro ticket prices, yeah. this there had been a lot of tension that had been building up for years. Are you saying that there's essentially some tension starting to build? Yeah, but we are annoying uh, you, because... Uh, 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 a lot of things that are happening right here in Colombia because the um, the killing of, of our social leaders, maybe the access of education as uh, that Mauricio mentioned. We have a lot of inequality. If you see the the wealth indicators, uh, we um, uh, we are the second country of inequality in Latin America. Right. Uh, the first is, I think, is Honduras or El Salvador. So uh, it's, it, there are uh, many things that we are protesting and we are uh, we are annoying. We are frustrated angry. By, yeah. We are fr frustrated. Is there much this. corruption? Yeah. A lot. A lot. A lot. Yeah. A lot of corruption. Around 5% of the GDP. The, the public GDP in Colombia is lost by, by corruption. It's a, maybe the most important problem of our country. Right, okay, okay. That's a very interesting point. Um, I was in El Salvador uh, on my previous visit to uh, South America. I went up to El Salvador afterwards, and uh, it was explained to me that the, the, you know, the new president of El Salvador, his, you know, his motto for his election was that we have enough money, we just need to stop stealing it from yeah. ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and if you ask me, uh, Colombia is a rich uh, country mm -hmm. because we have everything. We have a lot of natural resources. We have a lot of young people. We have uh, the, all, all weathers in, in the same country. You can go to, to the snow in, in two hours and can go to the beach in two hours. You have all you need to have a, a very wealthy country. But um, unfortunately, the, 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 the politicians... Uh, are stealing our 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 future by stealing the, the money of the public sector. Right. So that that's an important issue that we have to fight. And what is the status of education, the health system, and let's say also the uh, social care for the retired? Because they tend to be three of the most important issues that you know that people tend to focus on when they're frustrated with social programs. Um. The, the, the education system in, in the basic uh, education, it's uh, almost at 100% of, of covering. Okay. It's, it's, a, it's a good percentage. The quality is another thing. 
but uh, the the the. Um, but everyone can go to school. Yeah, but almost the, everyone. Yeah, uh, about the public education, uh, it's very hard that the people and the kids are accessing to uh, a good education and a public education, but it's more private right here. Uh, you don't access like in, in Europe, it's happening that you have your uh, high school or maybe your university uh, are paid by the government. Uh, it's not uh, the same thing you have, uh, right here. It's, it's more like a private education tool. Right, so there is, there is, a, there is a, a, a public education system provided by the government, but the quality questionable. The higher education, university, you have to pay yourself. And if you want to go to a very good school, it's private and you have to pay. Yeah, and, and, and in, in higher edu education, it's not that easy to, to access. It's maybe 45 or 50 percent, the percentage of, of access, not only to the university, also to technical programs and things like that, like that. But we have a very big problem because there is a very big percentage of the people that start the university and leaves the university. So that that's uh, why is that happening? Maybe I, I, I'm not an expert on, on okay. education. I, I read something about it, but uh, maybe it's for the quality of basic education, they have a, a lack of, of of some skills, and the university is very very hard. So that's maybe one problem. The second can be the economic situation of the students. Sometimes, sometimes they cannot eat or or have or, or take a bus or something. Okay. That that's maybe an, another situation. Uh, and maybe the third one is that in the private um, universities is very very expensive to access to 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 this kind of education. I don't know if you can yeah, add something. No, it's it's cheaper to have an education, a higher education outside of Colombia than here because it's uh, it's very expensive. So uh, the the cities don't have all the infrastructure to give the education to students, uh, as uh, Mauricio mentioned, uh, the public transport system it's, um, is not that, um, no, they don't have the coverage for uh, um, many of the, of the locations in Bogota. So uh, it's very hard when you, when you see people uh, trying to, to get into, the, into Transmilenio, that it's our public transport for free and then you are annoying because of it, but hey, I don't have opportunities for that, uh, so I need to transport. So I think there are many things to explain uh, what about uh, the quality and the access of education, but I think the, the most important thing is, is about the quality. Uh, but well, uh, the Universidad Nacional from Colombia, it's, it's, it, wanna, it, it was, it is the, the most important thing, uh, universities in Colombia. They don't have the, the enough access for people. They don't have the coverage. So I think that's the problem because it's, it's a very, very good university. What about the health system? What is the state of the health system? Is there a, is there a <laughs> public health system or is it entirely private? That, that is uh, one of the things that people are frustrated because the health system is very uh, unequal. If you don't have, uh, if you don't pay the, the health for yourself, you don't access to a uh, hospital, maybe if you are dying. That is one of the problems, the biggest problems that, that and the challenge that the government has because they say that they have the coverage, but they don't have, but people don't have the access. So that is one of the biggest problems that, that we have here because they are private, privatizing the, the health system. So if you don't have money, you don't have access. Yeah, yeah I have to say from my personal experience that it's, it's, a, it's a very bad experience actually, the, the, the public health system. Fortunately, I can pay my, my private help. But um, I think that maybe, and, and we come back to, to, the, to the main problem of Colombia, there is a lot of corruption in the system. In, in, the, in the, 
the delivery of drugs in the in the in the payment between uh, the, the institutions around health and the hospitals there is a lot of problems with with uh, with corruption and because the the the, inven the investment in budget is very high mm -hmm. but it's not efficient so the, we lost a lot of money in in, in that process so yeah it's yeah it, in my experience uh, comparing to europe i was in i was in and the hospital waiting for uh, about eight hours that somebody attends me. In fact, I have a, a good health plan and in, in I'm paying a good plan in my health system, but uh, I don't have it. Uh, comparing, uh, I was in Spain about two years ago and my daughter introduced a corn into her nose And then we had the problem, hey, we need to go to the hospital. And 30 minutes, we finished, uh, they attended with no, uh, with no documents, with no ideas. They said, hey, it's good. And then we go out. And so, hey, good for the Spanish uh, health system. And uh, comparing with Colombia, it's, it's, it's very, very different. Is so so different. In fact, with that people that are paying more uh, a high cost for health is is not that different than the people that don't access. Okay, okay. And how much is health insurance here for high quality private insurance? The, the price for, for private health. The price or yeah, is there? Is, I mean, is, is there a private health system with yeah? And how how, how expensive is the insurance? Uh, I, for example, I I pay for me and for my mother uh, like a hundred dollars per month. Okay, so I mean, that's not. What's the average? Do you know what the average wage is no. here? Okay, okay, I don't know. Yeah, I, I let can, me just you know. I'll the average wage. Yeah, uh, well, the, the no, the average is like eight hundred dollars, maybe. The average? Uh, 900, yeah. The, the minimum is like uh, 20, no, uh, $250, yeah, maybe. Like that. Right, the so minimum. A, uh, a person working in Colombia typically earns around 6.7 million COP per month. What's that translate? No, 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 it's, no, my, no. it's more like uh, it's $900 and oh, $2,000. $914,000. Yeah. Like, it's, it's the lowest average. It's kind of a mixed thing here, but but that's still that's a big chunk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah to take out. Okay, yeah. I understand. Not all the people can pay that. Yeah. Mm, no, no. Okay. Um, can you just update me on what the situation also is with FARC and the para paramilitaries? Because my understanding was that there was a peace agreement. Yeah. There was. Um, yeah. But I went up to Cucuta yesterday and. The paramilitaries are running some of the trading routes into Venezuela. So the paramilitaries still exist, but that to me sounds a little bit more like a criminal organization, less less so a ideological paramilitary mm -hmm. organization. What what is the situation there right now? Well, yeah, with, with FARC we signed an agreement, a peace agreement, like three years ago. Well, and three years in 2016. And 16, yeah, four years. And uh, in, in from from that point, uh, Colombia started a process to compensate victims, uh, to to try to keep the the public uh, force, the militaries, to to the zones that uh, FARC uh, controls in the past. Um, it's it's not a perfect process, uh, but uh, I think that the past government started a very good effort on on that. This one, I have to say, they, they try to continue, but uh, it's it's not the same like the past one because you know because they proposed them the, the the peace agreement and it's a different party like kind of opposition, but they're trying to co to continue the the process, but uh, there is some process it's some problem because some of the of the people that that were in the in the guerrilla in the process leave the process okay and go goes back to the to to the jungle you know. And, um, do you th is that is that because they're frustrated at the process, or do you think it's a, a loss of identity? They're almost institutionalized as, as a paramilitary group in the jungle, and they just don't want to leave it. You know, I, I only uh, I only can see what the news show yeah. show us because 
is, is different behind the scenes, you know? Uh, there's a lot of information there that we don't know. But uh, for me, it's more that they're scared that uh, maybe the, 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 they're scared that maybe the government is not going to 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 uh, respect the um, the agreement, right? Something like that. But um, as I said, it's I, I, we don't have the the information you don't know behind the scenes. A lot of things <laughs> happen behind. And uh, we just see the, the news that uh, 100 people leave the process or thing, thing like, uh, things like that. But most of the people that were in the guerrilla are still in the process. Okay. Most okay. of them. Okay. Yeah. All right. So the, the next area I just want to cover, because this is a good segue to get into Bitcoin, is that when I, uh, I did an interview with two people in, when I was in uh, Uruguay, they were from Argentina. And they talked about the history of money in Argentina. La, uh, I always pronounce this incorrectly. Uh, La Corralita. Corralito. Uh, Corralito. Yes. And they say because of that, because you know, essentially they had no access to their money and the value of their money was wiped out, there was a very different uh, understanding and opinion of money in Argentina. Therefore, something like Bitcoin becomes, uh, it's very obvious. It's, you know, people just understand it. What is the history of money in Colombia? You know, ha has there been any periods of hyperinflation which has decimated people's income? You know, wh what is the history here? Well, we started. We started the uh, the history of money right here in Colombia is the the private banks uh, controlling the money in the century about one hundred years. They are controlled by the private banks. And then when we the, the the countries were starting to control by the central banks with the Keynesian theory, the government controls. And then in the 90s and the, and the 80s, uh, we have a hyperinflation uh, with two digits. Uh, it's more like 20 or 30 percent of inflation. But the central bank right here in Colombia for the constitution, because of the constitution, they uh, they have to control the prices of the economy. Uh, in fact, we we have control. We are the country that have controlled the prices of the economy. We are in the uh, three percent of inflation uh, comparing to other countries. Well, you see, Venezuela is a hyperinflation. In comparing, I think the the um, uh, the monetary policy uh, of the central bank are doing very well, but they don't have the tools to uh, to make more uh, uh, life quality to people. They are more focused on the monetary policy, and then is not the biggest problem that that we live right now. Okay. But I, I think the central bank are, are, are doing well, uh, are doing uh, its job. So. Okay. Uh, I don't think that that maybe there's uh, the unique uh, thing that they have the they have the control in the international reserves and well uh, about the money. I think we are we are a small country. We 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 don't have this great economy. Uh, well, we we are actors in in the Latin American contest uh, about about uh, but in the in the monetary policy, we we are still a, a small country uh, comparing with, well, the U.S. or maybe Mexico or maybe Brazil that are the biggest countries for comparing. They are controlling their system, but they don't have the... I, I, I work in technology. I don't know about um, a lot about uh, economics, but <clears throat> I can say that when I was a child, the, the highest uh, money paper that I see in that moment was uh, a 500 pesos yeah. it was the highest and right now there is no there, there is no there is just coin of 500 because the lowest uh, paper of money that we have is 1000 so in 30 years we have uh, that situation and uh, the volatility of the colombian peso uh, versus the dollar is very high two years ago we were like to 2800 and right now we are at 3400 or something like that it's yeah and and the, and the um, informal economy about the cash the physical cash the uh, from 9 to 10 people use 
cash uh, to their transactions. The, uh, the e-payments that we know, the electronic payments, the debit or credit card, they don't they use by less than 10% of, oh, wow. of the population. So uh, this is uh, the, one of the problems about the digital economy that, uh, that people say because, hey, you are using cash. And it's uh, and it's uh, really really easy to use cash for people, and they trust about the cash. And uh, the informal economy uh, it's is very weak uh, in 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 Colombia. Okay. All right. Well, let's let's get into the Bitcoin side of things then. Um, and obviously, but, but, but I have to oh, say there is a lot of good things in Colombia <laughs> that maybe we have to, to to explain because we're focusing also maybe in the in the biggest problems. But uh, I have to send a message. Do you know what? That I, it's I, an, I, an, in, an incredible country to visit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, no, it is. I mean, it, firstly, it is beautiful. This yeah. is my first time here. If I can say this without sounding disrespectful, the women are beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, I've traveled through South America and, and, and Latin American uh, women are amazing. Uh, uh, amazing. Very strong women. I've, like, my experience is very strong, very um, pr um, proud women. Um, but they're beautiful here. <laughs> they are. No. Uh, no, and the people are too kind. Uh, everyone's so friendly. They, they, yeah, we, we are uh, a good people. We are funny people. Yeah. We always... Uh, uh, in fact, we, uh, perhaps we we have a lot of problems right here, but the people uh, are going and moving on, and then yeah, we, we we have a lot of friends from different different cities. And I have to say that they're not only beautiful, the women here in in Colombia, they're so intelligent and good leaders. The people that I most admire in in my career are, are women. For example, the president of the National University of Colombia. It's it's an amazing woman. They're a bit fiery. Powerful. They're fiery. They're a bit um, passionate. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to get on the wrong side of uh, a couple of the, the the women I've met out here. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> but we are Latinos, you know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, that's the thing. I'd, so I'd never been to Latin America until uh, Uruguay back in December, and I immediately had to come back. Uh, and I want to see all of it. It's an incredible continent with an incredible history. Um, fascinating but but colombia is phenomenal you, you might not even know the reason i ended up here in bogota bogota, bogota yeah. oh, doing that. <laughs> the reason i ended up in bogota is um i have a friend here and he's a, an ex-drug addict and he nearly died and so i came out to to visit him this is why i've ended up here okay. and i'm going to be interviewing him later okay. but he he'd been saying for a long time you've got to visit colombia he said colombia to me he said colombia is the best country in, in latin america i mean i know you're gonna say that, <laughs> but but I, I, I will say it i think it's incredible i mean look at the view we've got people yeah. can't see this look at this you know we're, we're in With the, the mountains, center yeah. we've got a mountain behind us it's sunny it's beautiful uh we've oh and the coffee yeah. down in kukata i had the best coffee i've had in my life Really? Yeah. I didn't need sugar. I didn't need milk. They made me as, uh, with a, um, a locally grown uh, bean. So you've got the best coffee. Yeah. You've got the best women. You've got amazing sunshine. I mean, what else do you need? <laughs> and we have a lot of very smart young people. Also, yeah. yeah. You do. And, okay, and so a nice weather. We so have the same weather the whole year. And we can go to, to different places. Uh, very cold, very hot. In... in, in, in Two hours. So you can ski or go to the beach? No, well, not the we, we don't <laughs> ski here. We, we have some, some uh, ice and things like that, but uh, we, we don't ski here. You, you we have to go to other places. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. the only thing. So that, that's a fair point, and I'm doing a dis disservice asking about the problems. Are there any other good things I've not talked about? Are there any other successes in yeah. Colombia I, I, haven't, uh, I haven't asked about that you want to talk yeah. about? Um, yeah, uh, for example, uh, th there is a lot of entrepreneurship right now. For example, uh, Alejandro, it's 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 uh, the leader, the CEO of, of Buda. But uh, there is a lot of movement and companies that are, are starting to 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 grow very heavily in, in, in Colombia. For example, we have an example of Rappi, that it's uh, it's now like a fintech. Uh, uh, up, but it starts on delivery of food, and they have a lot of services, and they have an investment of some ba soft bank from one billion dollars, and uh, there is a lot of examples that uh, we can present uh, on 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 that way. Yeah, I, I think uh, Colombia has uh, a great 
a great time to to explore the, the entrepreneurship and the government and entrepreneurs are are realizing that that uh, it's one of the the things that that we maybe we have the this bet for for grow the 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 community so in, in the example of of rapi that is our biggest unicorn uh, our first unicorn uh, right here in colombia uh, we are so proud of it but uh, we have a lot of challenge to 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 make this this happen right so but you can build on this yeah yeah i, I think i think there is a lot of opportunities uh, right here in colombia be, because uh, it's everything to build uh, right here uh, uh, In the, in the case of technology, we have a lot of opportunities for developers and and people that are growing the community uh, are more curious uh, about uh, how to use the technologies uh, for decentralized many things, and not only the company in the economy, but the social things. Uh, they are doing very very well. Yeah. Also, the the nature in Colombia it's amazing, and for people that the love. Uh, to visit amazing places, we have a lot of them in in the beach, in the in the um, in the coast, and in the jungle. And also, we have, for example, the coffee area that the people is amazing. In Bogota, you have an, a culture offer, amazing, and also a gastronomic offer. Yeah. Oh, uh, very good restaurants. The food here, yeah, is unbelievable. Yeah. The, we, the food. So, I, we've eat, I've eaten here both nights because it was so good. <laughs> yeah, you find you find a, a lot of experience right here in Colombia because you have beach, you have the mountains, you have uh, a cold places, a warm places, a hot places. So you find everything right here in Colombia. So it's it's very very good uh, to to see that that the, the foreigners and all the tourist people uh, uh, are very very interesting in, in Colombia and see what's happening and well and the people fun. is very happy. You know, you can talk with anyone and yeah. the people is very warm and and wants to know you that it's 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 a it's a good feeling the, yeah the colombian people have a good feelings with foreign foreign people and between us also so it's a good place to visit How, sure. how's the football team how's the national football team doing no 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 uh, i don't <laughs> no, want no, no, to talk it's about bad. it's not bad <laughs> no 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 yeah the 23 colombian team The sub sub 23 yeah. I don't know what to explain it but the, the young people uh, of the national team no are doing so bad we need to we need to <laughs> I focus on uh, on improve I remember two games where England have played Colombia oh, I true. remember once in a World Cup I think yeah. we won 2-0 Beckham yeah. scored a free kick but yeah. the game I remember most is uh, did you remember the game where your goalie did the scorpion yeah, 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 yeah. the goalkeeper He's a crazy it's man. A, yeah. It's an historical <laughs> moment, right? Well, um, it is. It's abs one of the most historical moments in football, yeah. but kind of a risky thing to do. <laughs> I mean, if he'd have got it wrong, you know, he would have looked like a fool. Yeah. I, I mean, I loved it. Yeah. I loved it. <laughs> uh, it's, you, you, it's an iconic f football moment in football history. Yeah, I remember the the World Cup in France. Yeah. The challenge. The, The England and Colombia that we lost 2-0 yeah. yeah. because of David Beckham. Yeah, yeah, it was a great free kick. I mean, yeah, it's a great to Beckham, free kick. Yeah. yeah, but but I hate Mondragon in this time. Yeah, but th that is <laughs> that is the Colombian people. Is it's 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 a risky guy. Yeah, uh, and there is a sentence that you use in Colombia that the risk that you have coming to Colombia is that we want to that you want to stay. Oh, I don't want to go. <laughs> That's well, a big I, risk. I say that, I, I, you know, because I'm off to Venezuela later today and I want to, I, I desperately want to go th for the food and the, the experience. And, and the, I've got to say, my experience don't get down to Cucutay, so we're going to get into this, and meeting the people of, people from Venezuela, they felt very similar to the Colombians. Yeah. They were also very friendly. Yeah. They were very hospitable. They wanted to tell their story and you could tell... We, we have a term we say they, they, they have a weathered face like you know they've been through a lot yeah. but again I, I, you know I was told to be careful I didn't I didn't feel unsafe at any point um, I, I, f I felt like th this is a group of people 
who are trying to do the job that the government should be doing for Venezuela. They were coming to earn money and get food and bring bring things back. Yeah. Uh, at, so I do want to go to Venezuela as well, but I I, I also don't want to leave. We, we are the same with Venezuelan people. Yeah, we're Colombian and Venezuelan are very similar. Uh, I I know a lot of people from Venezuela since uh, the people uh, stay right here in Colombia. So they are very nice people. They are very warm. They are very similar to us, so we share a, a, a lot of things. Maybe uh, you taste the arepa, no? Well, uh, the Venezuelan pepiada. Oh, yeah. the re reino pepido. Well, what was it called? Reina pepiada. Yeah. Reina pepiada. Oh, that yeah. was the cheese. Yeah. The cheese. Yeah, it's amazing. Oh, man. Yeah, we have the same. Uh, it's it's not the same thing. It's very similar. Yeah. That we have the arepa, but in different in different the, toppings the and fight ways. That we have with the Venezuelans is who do the better arepa. <laughs> 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 This one of the challenge be. Wow, I mean, the Venezuelan one I had yesterday was pretty good. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I had one in El Salvador as well, but it's called a pupusa or something. Oh, or pupusa. never been there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, no, and that was also been. very good. Um, well, we will see. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to that experience. But we, we should talk a little bit about Bitcoin. And I know yeah. specifically, Alejandro, you have, working for Buddha, you know, uh, Guillermo explained to me the experience they had of, with the banks, both in Santiago And here in Colombia, and the experience was, a, a, I mean, was it about 18 months you were? Yeah, about eight, uh, yeah, about a year. Yeah. Uh, we, we, we are, uh, we closed the, the operation yeah. right here in Colombia, trying to clarify with the financial authority. Uh, and I should just I should just let people know. So my interview with uh, Guillermo is not going to be coming out until after, around I think it's going to be towards the end of February. So people should know I did that first. So Buddha is the exchange which um, I covered in Santiago, but we, we've got to we've got a we've got to hold that back for a certain reason. So we're doing this one first. But you work for the same exchange. You, are you a partner? Did you find, were you one of the founders? Uh, in Colombia, right yeah. here in Colombia, we have a partnership with Guillermo yeah. and all the, the partners in, in Chile. Uh, so with my partner, we founded right here, Buda in Colombia. And we started uh, communicating with, with people, with public institutions about, hey, uh, it's, uh, the, our operation is forbidden or um, uh, they allow us. No, the, we don't have the blessing the, uh, about the government. They say, hey, uh, there is no restriction. It's not, uh, it's not about us. Uh, we don't have the, the situation. But with, with in 2017, that when Bitcoin grows up a lot, um, they, they paid attention about what, what was happening and have... Uh, And they communicate with uh, uh, with a document that the institution, financial institutions, are not allowed uh, to use cryptocurrencies or develop cryptocurrency services uh, right here in Colombia. So uh, the banks understood that uh, it includes all the crypto services that is not uh, a financial institution. So they close our account. And then we need to clarify it about with legal actions. We uh, we sue the financial authority, mm -hmm. and then we uh, they started to uh, conversations with them, and then well, uh, we we finally open um, at the middle in, in the last year. So what is the current state? Bitcoin is now legal to trade, mine, Bitcoin, spend? Yeah, Bitcoin is not regulated. Okay. Uh, it's not um, an illegal thing because you don't have uh, the regulation, but it's not forbidden. Oh, so it's... it's, so it's, 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 it's okay, so there's no regulations around it. Yeah, but there are no okay, regulations. Okay. So uh, is you it see, it's, it's legal. Uh, uh, They don't, we don't have a, a policy or a public policy that forbid that. But uh, the banks are very um, conservative in, in the moment that you open a banking account because we, uh, we, we've been living for uh, many criminal activities and they think that uh, there is a relationship between Bitcoin and these kind of criminal activities. In fact, the Ponzi schemes right here in Colombia uh, are very 
uh, useful to to rob uh, to people. Uh, we, have, we have a digger uh, now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, we'll cope. Um, we are building. But actually, we 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 are working with with financial institutions, trying to educate people to see that Bitcoin is is not the bad thing. The, okay. the humans are the bad thing. So. I, I guess uh, Bitcoin, uh, they are working. In fact, one of the, uh, the biggest banks in Colombia are working uh, with the blockchain of Bitcoin, doing some experimental, th experimental things. Okay. So, yeah. um, well, uh, we, we are in the same side. We are on the dark side, but many people for, for are supporting us. For the regular people, they can use it. For the citizens, they have no problem to, to use it. It's only for the financial system. There is some... It's not a specific restriction. It's a letter that the regulators sent to the to the banks, saying that they recommend not to use any of these uh, crypto assets okay. or, or something like that. But uh, it it has so consequences in in, in 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 the sector because if the bank says that a public institution is saying that a regulator, so the other public institutions say, I cannot say it's something different that the regulator. So it's more than for the financial sector in the practice but uh, there is no law that 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 said you cannot use it or something yeah like that. Uh, the the congress are working on a project law to um to try to promote the regulation on exchanges or cryptocurrency operators right here in colombia uh, but it's it's only the beginning of, of the actually of the, the, the congressman that promotes that uh, project of law that is uh, his name is Mauricio Toro. Uh, good name. Yeah, it's a good name. <laughs> <laughs> very very similar to me. And uh, and it's a very young co congressman, and uh, he opened the possibility to to uh, to to the people that wants to vote for him in the campaign to uh, give him a Bitcoin. Oh, yeah. right. Finance. Yeah. Finance with Bitcoin. We Interesting. Are, we, we work with them in the, in the, um, in the campaign. So it works uh, a little bit, uh, but they, they show that work uh, that Bitcoin works for that. So Interesting. He sent that We're message. trying to reply the experience of, of a congressman in the U.S. that... Uh, they finance their the, the, their campaign with with Bitcoin. So is, is Bitcoin taxed here? And uh, no, there are there are documents are uh, pronouncement uh, about the the what it's the tax. <laughs> Getting nearer, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> in fact, we are in the industry they are working on. Yeah. The, the well, we'll we'll just we'll cope. We'll cope. <laughs> People have to put up with a bit of digging okay, in the yeah. background. But uh, about the tax tax situation, uh, we don't have the the announcement of the tax authority right here. They say that hey, you you need to uh, be be careful when when you when you start buying and then you 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 tax it. But uh, there are a lot of things to to tax uh, the Bitcoin. So oh, okay, okay. We don't have this one thing that maybe say hey you need to tax Bitcoin like this. Next up, I talked to Mauricio and Alejandro more about Bitcoin in Colombia and also what's happening in Venezuela. But before that, I got a message from my amazing sponsors. So first up, it's the Mighty Kraken. Yes, the best place to buy, sell and trade Bitcoin. I'm always telling you this, but why are they the best? Well, they've consistently been rated the best and most secure cryptocurrency exchange. So whatever level your experience, Kraken has designed and built a streamlined Bitcoin exchange for newcomers and Bitcoiners alike. Their platform provides world-class financial stability by maintaining full reserves, healthy banking relationships, and the highest levels of legal compliance. They pair their global 24-7, 365 live chat with an extensive support center to help ensure your questions are answered and your needs are met around the clock. No matter who you are 
or where you are. They offer an exclusive and additional layer of near real-time hyper-personalized support through their Kraken account management program. And with Kraken Pro, a beautiful mobile-first app, you can trade Bitcoin wherever you want. There is no better place to trade Bitcoin. So find out more, head over to kraken.com or download the app, which is available for the iPhone and Android. Just search for Kraken Pro, which is K-R-A-K-E-N-P-R-O. And next up, we have the amazing BlockFi, the future of Bitcoin and financial services. I was hanging out with Zach. I met up with him in Mexico, found out about everything that's coming. It's going to be a really big year for BlockFi. So many announcements coming. I cannot wait to tell you about some of these. But they've already made some, you know. They announced their BTC Rewards credit card. Cannot wait to get that. Cannot wait to get sats back on my purchases. And they've also got a mobile app coming. This is on top of their already very successful crypto back loans and their interest accounts for your Bitcoin, Ether, or GUSD. Yes, it's going to be a massive year. Cannot wait to work with them. Cannot wait to tell you about everything that's coming. But if you are interested in finding out more about BlockFi, do your own research, then head over to BlockFi.com, which is B-L-O-C-K-F-I.com. What has adoption been like for Bitcoin here in Colombia? You know, uh, is, there a, is there a widespread adoption or is it still early? Like, how are you doing? Is is is. It's not easy to know, but if you see the, the statistics in local Bitcoin, yeah. Colombia, normally is the sixth or seventh uh, country in the world with most volume in trading in local Bitcoins. Maybe the reason can be, uh, uh, first of all, because we are very close to Venezuela. Venezuela yeah. is normally the second country with biggest volume in, in local Bitcoins. And uh, most of the Venezuelans that, that are living in Venezuela come to Colombia. And where, when they're here and have uh, some job and they want to send some money, they use Bitcoin. They use another alternatives also, but they also use a lot of, a lot of Bitcoin. Uh, the second that I, can, uh, that I can say that people is trying to, to find options because the, fin- the financial sector in Colombia is 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 not a good experience like in the states or 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 in Europe that you have a very good experience with the financial sector in Colombia it's it's not a good one and i i think that the people is trying to find uh, options on on that and the third one maybe is that and and i have to say that maybe there is some movement between between people between uh, cross border payments but also some of them is from money laundering and things like that. Yeah, I think uh, one of the statistics that we have in Buddha is more like uh, an speculation and more like an investment options that we have an alternative options for uh, traditional stock markets. So it's one of the, of the main thing that people invest in Bitcoin. Uh, but uh, uh, one one thing uh, additionally is uh, as Mauricio mentioned about the cross border payment between Venezuela because they have a lot of restriction in the in the um, currency exchanges uh, uh, so is one of the biggest thing uh, that's why because Venezuela and Colombia has the most volume uh, trading volume in in local bitcoins uh, in fact when you when you check um, you know, the wallets and other things, you see more volume. Is not only the the local thing, uh, local bitcoins shows. So well, we'll talk about that because that's going to be my next destination. So just before we do that, just a final question on kind of Bitcoin here in um, Colombia. Are there any unique challenges that you are having here with regards to Bitcoin that anyone should be aware of, or or are your challenges with Bitcoin universal? Well, uh, I think that one of the challenge to um, to get this kind of adop- adoption of Bitcoin, it's more like a, a culture thing. We are uh, uh, living most of the biggest fraud about the criminal activities. So people think that Bitcoin are uh, are promoting that that it's very very uh, wrong thoughts about uh, about what we're doing but um, it specifically is bitcoin here tied to the drug trade at all it, well the the financial authorities said that bitcoin are using for that but people are afraid because the financial authorities said 
Right. And when you when you see the the, the financial authorities saying, "Hey, no, uh, just be careful with Bitcoin because they are using for criminal organizations to to deal for with drugs." And is that gen- is that generic or sp- or are they talking specifically about the cartels using Bitcoin? Uh, I don't know if the cartel are using it because. If you see the, the the digital traceability that Bitcoin has, uh, I prefer to get my submarines and using uh, the physical cash to, yeah. to, yeah, to use it. I, to use I don't think that are using it, but okay. maybe uh, when you see the a lot of phishing and hacking and the ransomwares and all the stuff in the, in the digital um, uh, technology you see, um, the organizations, the uh, the police and all the international organizations are, are saying, hey, just be careful b- with Bitcoin because they are paying the rescue of information on, on Bitcoins and all the stuff. But it's more uh, about the wrong thing that the financial authority and uh, uh, a few public institutions are thinking about Bitcoin and the technology because they said, hey, blockchain, yes, but Bitcoin, no. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I don't like Bitcoin. That whole bullshit saying. Yeah, yeah. so uh, uh, I, I think it's a, uh, it's a wrong way to, to treat the technology because Bitcoin is a, te- it's a technology uh, in... in uh, I, it, it doesn't consider uh, that so... I, I think it's more like a, about the culture that we have, uh, the relationship between the money and the criminal things. So the money, uh, when you use the pesos colombianos and the dollar, uh, you you say the same thing. But Bitcoin is one of them. So yeah, and and I think if you spend three months using Bitcoin, you can see that it's not a good idea to do uh, <laughs> that that kind of things. Uh, <laughs> Uh, with with Bitcoin because they they can the, the traceability of Bitcoin and if you send the Bitcoin or, of those guys send Bitcoin to three person and those goes to exchanges and they use the ARD they can know who who you are with yeah, with artificial intelligence or yeah, something, things like that so it's it's not a good idea and if you if you know a, a little bit about the technical part you you can see that but it's most like a, that. It's, it's a narrative that they want to send to the public that Bitcoin is just for this and for dark web and money laundering and things like that. But I think that one big challenge that we have here, and it's different from, from other countries, is that I don't know if it's for our history with drugs and things like that, but we have a lot of Ponzi schemes here. It's 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 like a cancer. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, you, can you create see you create a Ponzi scheme with mandalas and hawks. Uh, one of the uh, of one of Ponzi schemes that um, uh, restrict the the financial authority was with hawks and mandalas. Yeah. So you see that it's ridiculous how how people convince other people to. Uh, to invest in that, that, that kind and of Unfortunately, then things. using the name of Bitcoin for that. In the past, they right. used that kind of, of, of things, but right now they're using, and in the past year, they're using the, 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 the Bitcoin name. And uh, maybe I, I can understand the authorities on, on that part because, you know, a lot of people lose, lose her, her money and uh, the, their money and they go to the regulator and say, okay, I want my money, my money back. Right. Uh, where is your money? No, in Bitcoin. But that is a. Uh, and where is your Bitcoin? No, in in this company and things. But that is a Ponzi scheme. Okay. You know, okay, it's, yeah, yeah. that that is a that 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 is very tough for. But for but I think we we are showing that we 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 can be self-regulated, and we are trying to show the the government and the public institutions that it, that our self-regulation uh, it's it's good for people. But maybe we, we we build that that thing that that trust with, with people. We we have uh, four years and we are four, in four years in the market, and we are trying to get that trust with, with people right. and the financial institution. But well, there there are many thoughts about. Uh, so you, so your main job here really, well, one of your primary jobs here is, well, there's two. Is education, yeah. but you you also have to do a bit of a PR job, a public relations job for for Bitcoin because of the misinformation. Yeah. 
Yeah, in my experience, when we try to educate people and we we have a lot of events in the year, trying to promote uh, a responsible use of, of the technology, many people say, "Hey, why do you speak uh, a lot about Bitcoin?" And hey, we are focused on blockchain. Hey, you need to understand Bitcoin to use the technology. Is the first step, and is the real case that we are using with in real life in, in the world. So you need to understand Bitcoin uh, after uh, before before to know the the blockchain technology. So it's one of the biggest challenge that we have for people that create uh, this kind of central things uh, about the regulation, about what the financial system works. So uh, yeah, I say hey, no. First, you need to learn more about Bitcoin, and then. You can use the the technology as you want, but okay. first you need to yeah. learn. And, and from the technology perspective and in the market perspective, it's important because if you say Bitcoin, no blockchain, yes. And then when you have another use case that decentralizes some other authority or company, they're going to say no. So it starts with Bitcoin, no blockchain, yes. But when you have another alternative or another option, they will say again, no. So it's, it's very important to, to, to open uh, the market uh, in, in this time, uh, thinking about the future. And maybe that is why it's very important this project of the congressman, because people is, is going to the black markets, you know, to, to, because they want, the, the, they want Bitcoin, they want crypto, and they're going to, to places that are not regulated. And with this law, the, the exchanges have to accomplish some requirements that protect the users uh, to, to buy uh, in, in a safe places. So that, that's why it's very important for, yeah. for, for the ecosystem. The president, the president of, uh, of FinTech Technology Association right here in Colombia uh, said that it's more about uh, what we grew up thinking that regulation is uh, the safest thing to promote a technology or maybe an idea. So we are uh, we grew up with the Spanish culture about the regulation is great, uh, is not the uh, is different between other countries when you say that the regulation is is very restrictive and they don't have open the technology because the law is lower than than technology so uh, in in Colombia we think that if it's not regulated it's bad is one of the uh, the things that uh, we are maybe thinking in fact we, we have the the case of uber that yeah. it's uh, uber is uh, goes out Colombia because they don't have the regulation and they have the the the, the conditions to to um, to establish right here in Colombia in a in a judge decision that makes a hey, you uh, you are forbid uh, right here in Colombia it's it's one of the problems that we have okay. uh, it's not regulated it's bad uh, that's one of the uh, of the thoughts uh, by the way, Bitcoin. Bitcoin just went over 10K while we were doing this interview. Oh, really? yeah, you know, it tipped yeah. below. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> um, so one of the things we ca I can't end this interview without talking about is Venezuela. Um, I think people in the, let's say broadly crypto, not just Bitcoin, have a, have a habit of looking at uh, Venezuela as a great use case for Bitcoin. And uh, I know people who have worked on uh, looking a bit closer on what the reality is. So Ale Alejandro uh, Machado, you know. Machado, Alejandro Machado. Machado. Is it Machado? Yeah. I've got every pronunciation wrong in this interview. <laughs> Alejandro, I've been calling him Machado since my first interview over a UK. Macho, <laughs> Machado. I'll, uh, anyway, so uh, Alejandro was my introduction to Venezuela, my first interview over a year ago, and I've done a couple more. And I noticed there's been some closer studies. There are other projects that are, uh, like Dash is often talking about in Venezuela. But I wanted to really understand the reality and, and kind of cut through the bullshit. And I think there is a lot of bullshit. Mm -hmm. But, you yeah, know, and I went to Cucuta yesterday, the, the, the border crossing to um, Venezuela, a, a, a incredible experience for a number of reasons, which I will cover in future. But just as a starting point, uh, Mauricio, because I think 
we should just try and allow people to understand how desperate the situation is inside Venezuela yeah. and then what exactly is happening on the border. And, the, and also add into that, most of the other borders have all been closed. This one remains open. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Colombia has been very welcoming yeah. and very supportive yeah. of the people of Venezuela. Uh, essentially, have become a lifeline. Yeah. And I understand there is a history there in that when there was a time when there were Colombians going into Venezuela because yeah. Venezuela was the richest country and you know Colombia had its own problems. So there is like this brotherhood relationship between the two countries. But can you just explain to people, you know? What is really going on in Venezuela? And then talk about what's happening on the border. Yeah, um, yeah. the the history is that uh, the economic in Venezuela 20 or 30 years ago was so good. And uh, in Colombia, not that good. So a lot of Colombians went there. I I think that almost 30 million of Colombian people went to, to Venezuela. That's why we have a very strong relationship between the two countries. We, we are, we are, um, we are very near also, but uh, we, that's one of the reasons. And a lot of those Colombians are, are still there. Right. A lot of them, uh, some of them come back, yeah. And, and I agree that it's a lot of hype be- what it, oh, regarding what is happening about uh, Bitcoin and crypto in, in Venezuela. They are using a lot. They, they are using for a store, in value, a store of value to, to solve the problem of hyperinflation. But they're also using a lot of US dollars. Yeah. Uh, actually, in, in Caracas, there uh, is more use the, the US dollar than, than Bitcoin right now. Uh, it's, uh, it's a dollar economy right now, what Alejandro mm-hmm. explained us because he, he was there very recently. And um, there is a lot of uh, another projects of cryptocurrencies that say, no, Venezuela is the place, Venezuela is happening a lot. But for example, uh, the past week, we, we want to know about projects there in Venezuela, developers uh, that are working in Venezuela, in Bitcoin and blockchain. It was very difficult to find uh, people working very, very heavily. It, I, I, but uh, in the other hand, I, I heard about histories of friends of mine that have companies and that hire developers in Venezuela. And they have a problem because they pay with Bitcoin to the developers. They, they, they have uh, the enough money to leave the country and they live. So the people that are um, accumulating b- Bitcoin are living in Venezuela. Maybe it, it, the, the people that are saving Bitcoin are living in Venezuela. So maybe that's another reason why uh, there, there is no um, a full trade of Bitcoin in Venezuela because when you have enough money, you can go out of, of Venezuela. You can escape. Yeah, you can escape. And I know there are people there because I've spoken to them and I'm going to be meeting some of them. Uh, my experience yesterday, I, you know, I, I went with two goals. I obviously have a Bitcoin podcast and I want to find out what's happening there and the, the truth, what the truth is. I don't know if you know, I also have another podcast called Defiance which is more about activism and political issues and things. So I also just had it a, had a general human interest in what's, what's really happening for the people there. Um, my kind of perspective is that people don't, it's not that people want Bitcoin. People want food, medicine, and yeah. basic, basic amenities. Yeah, it's, uh, not, it's not about the need. It's not about the opportunity. It's all about the needs yeah. that Venezuela people need right now. And so, they're very basic needs. Yeah, it's very basically. When you, when you see uh, about 30 years ago, Venezuela was the most powerful country in Latin America because of the oil, uh, petroleum yep. and all the stuff. But when you see people right now trying to get the opportunity uh, you don't see the opportunity on the technology because you see hey bitcoin is revolutionary hey i want to invest no they have some needs that you provided and one in one of the cases that are working in uh, in the um, in the observatories and all the centers that are uh, investigating the the, the venezuelan situation they say that bitcoin works for this kind of refugees right here in Colombia and other countries in Latin America, that they are sending money to their families. Bitcoin is is the is the greatest uh, discovery in 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 the in the country. So, 
when you see the kind of situation that you lost money, you print the money and you use it for origami and other things, you say, hey, there is a lot of problems that maybe Bitcoin help uh, people. So, Well, so the, the, I saw a lot yesterday in Kukata, but strangely, the, th the thing that caught my eye the most and stuck with me because I'd heard about this was one lady she had a giant bag of toilet rolls toilet paper mm -hmm. carrying back because mm. I'd heard you know access to even to the basics such as toilet paper is very difficult but I mean and I saw all different kinds of things people take back food and you know cigarettes and medicine everything but that one stood out to me because that's quite a journey to go just to you know you I we just go to a local store right but mm -hmm. she's having to cross the border to go mm -hmm. across to buy this and so I think what people need to understand is that there are these absolute basic needs. There, are, there is the economy has essentially died in significant parts of Venezuela. I know it's building up again in uh, Caracas, and mm -hmm. you know Maduro has started. Maduro has started to change his policies to build the economy up, and I know that's happening. But there are these absolute basic needs people have. There are also people who can't work, or there is no work, or. Mm -hmm. They have, and they're also people who are just hungry, yeah. very hungry. And I'll tell, this, I'll tell part of a story of somebody I met. I won't tell all of it. But um, I went to one of the NGOs to interview the director. And I mentioned this to you, but there was, a, there was a young man in there with his wife and their baby. And the baby was less than a year old. Uh, he'd left his three children in Venezuela. And he'd come to try and get a job to earn money um, to send food back to his parents and his children. And he, he himself, his wife, and his child had been... He hadn't been able to find a job. And they'd been living on the street for a week. Mm. You know, no cover. And they were explaining to me that every night they're having to even hold hold everything tight because people might even try and steal their clothes. So he said you, he was almost sleeping with one eye open. But what was really powerful, and one of the things really powerful about his experience, what he was explaining, and a lot of people, is that... The, these people aren't just coming into Kukata to earn money to feed themselves. They're actually, everyone's trying to also earn money to send things back. Like the the economy in Kukata is actually providing resources back into these border towns. Is that a is that a fair observation? Well, well I, I think it's a fair observation. I, I think it's a fair observation about um, what was happening in the border. But when you see, um, you see that there are many things that are happening inside Colombia, uh, at center in Colombia, and not only the border that are happening at the same thing. It's not is not only about the border. Uh, you mean I mean when you see cities like Bucaramanga, Bogota, um, and cities close to um, uh, to there, uh, you see that. Uh, many people are earn money and trying to uh, send money to to their families, and they have all the difficulties that poor people has. Uh, and and we don't have uh, as a Colombian, uh, we we don't have all the conditions to attend all the people that are migrating to yeah. to Venezuela. Uh, we don't. Uh, it, it's 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 a sad a sad thing because we uh, we want to help people, but uh, there's a lot of people migrating to to Colombia. So it's mi millions. We're talking in millions. Millions. Yeah. We we spoke about one or two million people, uh, two million Venezuelan people in uh, Colombia, but in, in the Colombia. rest of the world, four million. Yeah, four yeah. million. Yeah, you it's see, 10 in Chile, of the population much in Venezuela. Ten percent of the population. I don't know if you when you when you stayed in Chile. Uh, Chile is about five hundred five hundred thousand people living uh, in Chile. They migrate uh, across the country, across the continent, and, and it's very very sad to to see that. Yeah. So and and interestingly, on my flight on the way over. I was chatting to a lady from Colombia and she said, look, we want to help the people of Venezuela, but there's been so many. And what's happening is they're taking the jobs and they're, they're willing to work for half the price. And that's a lot of money. You, you know, someone can come and work and even earn like $200, but that's a lot of money in Venezuela. Um, just, just taking it full circle back to the, the Bitcoin thing, because the, the thing people want to understand is that the real use case, which again is limited, but it is 
what is explained to me is that a lot of people in Venezuela can't get bank accounts. They don't have the ID or they don't have the money. So it has become a way of just people coming into Colombia earning money. They're buying the Bitcoin. They're using it for remittance to send money back to their family who then sell it that side to be able to buy food and things. That That's the real use case. Yeah, and, and I think that uh, Bitcoin is very powerful on that because so many countries want to send for example, help help to, to the Venezuelan people. And Maduro can stop that help. But with Bitcoin, he cannot do anything. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a real way to help. Bitcoin is a... If the other go governments want to help the Venezuelan people, they will try to open the opportunity to Bitcoin because mm -hmm. Maduro cannot do anything. But there is, the, there is a problem, is that uh, not all of the Venezuelan people have a smartphone. It's smartphones. They're sharing yeah. their smartphones. I noticed that. Yeah. Or they don't have data. Yeah. And not only for, for, for financial things, also, for example, for message or WhatsApp. They're sharing between uh, uh, neighbors uh, the, the smartphones uh, because not all of them have, a, have access to, 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 to this technology because it's very expensive for them. They prefer to have money to eat or, or, or the basic things than for a smartphone, but uh, normally they have a friend that help them to, to use or, or send some message or use Bitcoin or something like that. Yeah, I think it's, it's the magic of Bitcoin when you have in trouble with your country and all all the things that are happening in the emerging markets, in Africa, in South America, and Latin America, you see that Bitcoin works because uh, uh, it's it's very very helpful for people when you uh, transfer money uh, uh, as easy as an email when you send an, an email. So. Um, it, I think it's one of the real use cases what's happening in Ven between Venezuela and Colombia. But these are these different... This is why it's useful doing this, traveling around the world and meeting people and understanding uh, the different local challenges because, like I said, the, the use case of Bitcoin for somebody who's living in New York or London is very different from somebody in Kukata, right? As you said, it's they true. might not have a phone. If they've got a phone, they might not have data. You know, So is there a, requ a requirement for mesh networks? If the people are using Bitcoin, they probably don't give too much of a fuck about long-term savings and stuff. They just want to get some Bitcoin. They want to be able to send it to their family home, and their family want to be able to send it, uh, sell it, and they want to be able to buy food. It's about. It's really Bitcoin. So, so I would say for me, Bitcoin is a speculative tool on the future growth. For these people, it's a tool of survival. It's a genuine tool of survival outside of let's say the more wealthy Venezuelans who are like developers and coders who you know, can earn. When we're talking about the border town, we're talking about Bitcoin as a tool of survival. Therefore, what are the things that need to be built? What is the infrastructure that's needed that can help these people with these absolute basic needs of getting money from point A to point B? How do they get it? How do they transfer it? How do they sell it? And that that's a very different experience, like I say, from you know, successful Western nations, right? Yeah. yeah. That's true. Yeah. Maybe in Argentina they are using Bitcoin as, as a store of value because they are not so bad like, like in, in Venezuela, but they have this uh, hyperinflation problem also. Uh, and a massive distrust yeah. of the banks yeah. and the government. I know that because my brother lives there uh, from the past 13 years and he's living all of these cycles of the economy in, yeah. the, in, in Argentina. And uh, it's it's very pain, painful uh, every time the, the the Argentinian pesos goes down like 35% in 20 hours or, or something. It's it's very painful for not only for him, it also also for for yeah. the relatives here in in Colombia and other countries. And I think the Argentinian people uh, have are very strong on that because they have a very big history. And uh, maybe that's why uh, the the. Bitcoin and crypto companies in Argentina are very strong because they find this option very early, earlier than us because we don't have the need or, or we didn't have that, that need uh, eight years ago as, I, as they have it. And they are building on that. Mm. So I, I think that um, in, in Argentina, it's, it's more for a store of value than for basic things or living. Uh, but in, in Venezuela, I agree with you that it's more for, for the 
day-to-day living thing. Yeah. And if people, I think one of the things I've noticed, if people want to help, there are NGOs operating in Kolkata. Yeah. They're providing education. You know, they're providing meals. Yeah. They provide. When I say education, they're providing education to the children who who aren't in school right now. So they're providing that. But they're also providing Bitcoin education. The best thing you can do is just make some kind of donation. And interestingly, a hundred dollars of Bitcoin in Kolkata goes a long way. Mm-hmm. It goes a very long way. I mean, you were saying to me. I mean, I I, I mentioned I gave a bit of money to somebody. A, sm- a small amount of money can go a long way in Venezuela. You, like, just so people get some perspective, let's, let's say $20. How much money is $20 to somebody living in Venezuela? Uh, $20 in, in Venezuelan money, it's, it's a lot. It's maybe enough to, to live uh, one month, I think. For a family? Uh, uh, entire family lives with $20 in, in Venezuela. Uh, that's why the the problem of of hyperinflation of uh, the the lost cost of money yeah. produced uh, on on the on this, this kind of decisions that Venezuela does. So and uh, in fact, when you see twenty dollars right here in Colombia is not enough money to buy something on to live one month, and uh, in a day you you spend that money. When you see uh, Venezuela, you can live for three months or five months. Uh, uh, the stamps. Uh, so I think when you see that, when you see that difference between the uh, the value, the the money value in, in different countries, you see that uh, Venezuela is uh, is in is in very very good, uh, very traveled uh, mm. right here. So. Well, I'm looking forward to going. I go later today. Hopefully, I'll, I'll get through immigration without any problems. <laughs> um, you know, but. It'll be an interesting experience. Um, and I, want, I want to find out the reality of you know what life is like there. So yeah, that will be interesting. But hey, listen, we've done an hour and twenty five minutes. Usually I want an hour. Uh, <laughs> what a fascinating interview. Great to meet you both. Uh, consider you friends now. I hope to come back. I really have enjoyed my time here. I uh, thank you for your hospitality. If I can ever do anything for you guys, you know, you just reach out. You let me know. But do you want to just if people want to. You know, get in touch with you. We want to speak to you. Do you want to tell them how they can you get hold uh, hold of you? I'll let you go first this time, Alejandro, because <laughs> Mauro, you went first last time. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you, thank you, Peter, for for having us. It was a great time to to see that uh, in Colombia, uh, Bitcoin is happening, uh, and, and it's very very great to have you here. Uh, and check what's happening and and well good luck in Venezuela because there will be a very very interesting experience so uh, no uh, if people want to communicate uh, I'm from Buddha.com so my, my Twitter is Abel, uh, Abeltran 83 83 Abeltran 83 okay I'll put that in the show notes yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, and well, no, my email Alejandro uh, arroba Buddha dot com. So, well, no, uh, thank you, thank you, Mauro, for inviting me too as well. So, thank you, and Mauro. Uh, thank you very much for visiting us. This is your home, and for all your listeners. Oh, thank you. Yeah, uh, Colombia is a great place to visit. So. Uh, we're very happy to have you here and thank you for, for sharing with, with, with all your listeners what you saw in Venezuela, what you saw here in, in Colombia. It's, it's very important to, to, to people to know the real uh, things that are happening. And um, uh, my Twitter account is Mauro Tov and I'm on LinkedIn. And if, if, you, if you love uh, pictures, I have a... a uh, not crypto pictures is uh, <laughs> <laughs> landscape and things like that. I have an um, Instagram account that it's also Mauratov. It's just for pictures. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, and we, we also have an account of Blockchain Colombia in Twitter. You, you can find us in, in, in uh, Facebook and everything. Uh, and we have a meetup with more than 2,000 of people there. Uh, so, yeah, and if you come to Colombia, you can contact us and we're very happy to talk and build. Yeah, please let us know when you come back to Colombia and invite you some beers and, well, well I look have forward fun. To it. Yeah. Okay, well, listen, all the best. Uh, thank you again. And, yeah, I, I hope people 
uh, hope people listen to this and I hope they come and visit uh, Colombia because it is a beautiful country amazing people and yeah all the best guys thank you very much Peter. thank you all right what did you make of that pretty interesting right so in South America, countries like Argentina and Venezuela seem to get most of the tension from Bitcoiners. And you know, it's understandable. With issues around hyperinflation and currency controls, there is an obvious use case for Bitcoin. But you don't hear so much about Colombia or some of the other South American countries. So it's really interesting to get an idea of how Bitcoin is being used here and the community in Colombia. I mean, I was mainly here to understand what is happening on the Venezuelan and Colombian border. We hear so much about Venezuela. But it was also great to hear more about the Colombian issue specifically. And I've got more shows coming up about this. I've also recorded one in Chile. So keep an eye on this. There's going to be loads of shows about Bitcoin around the world this year. And as ever, if you've got any questions, you can reach out to me. My email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com. Also, if you want to support the show, if you like what I do, if you want to help out, there's so many things that you can do to support the show, whether it's leaving a review or just becoming a sponsor, you know, or share it with your friends. It doesn't matter what you do, it all helps. It's all up on my website. Just head over to whatbitcoindid.com and click on the support section. And yeah, I'm off to Venezuela today. It's going to be a pretty interesting trip. Kind of excited, also a little bit nervous. But yeah, hopefully I'll have uh, some nice reports of what's going on with Bitcoin there soon enough. Anyway, if you've got any questions, feel free to reach out to me. My email address is hello at whatbitcoindid.com. 